Welcome to another episode of Top Lines and Tales, continuing with our series of looking at imports of livestock from continental Europe into UK. The Charolais sheep originate from eastern France in the Burgundy region, an area also known for some decent white wines. Although one of the largest numbers of sheep breed in France, their origins actually go back to the Leicester and Southdown flocks from UK. The breed dates back to the beginning of the 20th century, and a Charolais was recorded winning the carcass competition at the Paris show as far back as 1909. The first five Charolais sheep arrived at Wymondon in Norfolk in the back end of 1976 to Jonathan and Carol Barber. I'm pleased to have on the podcast this week Robert Patterson from Orkin Lay near Stirling. Welcome back, Robert. How are you doing, Andy? And uh, Jonathan Aitken, breeder and council member from Northern Ireland. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. And Johnny, where would Jonathan Barber have first got the idea of importing Charolais sheep? Well, I would say he probably was out with his NSA connections and seeing the ease of management and the meat yield on them to that impressed him for the, the British market, probably. A society was formed with him as chairman, and it would be a family affair uh, with his parents as well and, and with Carol, and running a number of prefixes under the umbrella of Norfolk Charolais. Jonathan had quite a tight control of the breed for quite a while, and uh, Grogan went on to be a flock to underpin a lot of other flocks, as well as officiating the imports of the sheep. And Carol would carry on running the ship for many years, and uh, an able couple, if ever there was, uh, uh, been there a long time. Is Jonathan still CEO, uh, Johnny? Uh, he just actually has retired this spring from from that position. He's been there <laughs> nearly four decades, uh, a, a long service medal for sure. And there would would have been a problem back then with Maida Visner in Europe at that time in the 70s, so it would limit the selection process as it did with, uh, with other breeds. Uh, it was an issue, wasn't it, back then? It definitely was, and you know the, the rules into Britain changed, and and even when it, when it come to bringing sheep to Northern Ireland, it was a, another different set of rules as well. But you know the, the the people that did bring them in, they had to jump through a lot of hoops. But personally, I'm glad they did because the Charlies are a good breed. And by uh, 1979, there were flocks in Scotland, uh, Jim Neal being one of the main ones. And uh, Robert Jim Neal was a hard man to beat, wasn't he? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Jim, uh, Jim had a great flock of sheep uh, through the 80s and into the 90s. Yeah, we'd, we'd be one of the very first. There was himself and his cousin, Ewan Hislop, um, brought them in, along with two or three other boys in the Fleischer, I think. Uh, the Mackies at Broomhouse. Broomhouse, is they, they would be early in the Scottish lot, and John Maxwell, the Gaul. Uh, that would be our kind of first flocks in Scotland, I think. And uh, Johnny, yourselves and your father, James, in Northern Ireland there, when did you guys get started with the Carnew flock? Well, we started the Carnew flock in 1990, but I w- was involved with Charlie's before that through Jim Quayle and the, the Mulligan brothers, Jim and William. And uh, my father would have helped out as well and, and dressed a lot of Charlie sheep just before that. And those boys had seen the the, the Charolais when they'd been buying limousines down in France, I think. Uh, that that was sort of, uh, the, they just spotted them and thought this is another breed they could bring into the country. And uh, quite a few flocks were started from their exploits, I think, in, in Northern Ireland, including uh, Drew Cowan at Tellier. And, and, uh, did you work for Jim for a while, uh, Johnny? I did, yeah. I worked for Jim for, for quite a few years. When I was younger, I used to go and help out at it when he had the sheep and then he dispersed the sheep and just kept the Paraguay limousin cattle and I worked there for quite a while after that with the, with the limousins. Learned a lot of my trade and met a lot of people through helping Willie Mulligan at the shows. That's how I come to meet so many people in the mainland whenever they were over judging or buying stock. And there was another man in there called Terry Robinson and was the chairman of Coca-Cola, if I remember right. And uh, he worked closely with those guys as well, didn't he, with those early sheep? Yeah, Terry was there, an, an, an absolute gentleman and a, an ambassador to the breed. Anything he, he put his hand to, it was done 110%. He was a, a real gentleman, a fantastic man to, to be associated with. To remember him well. And uh, the first auction was held at Bambury in 1983, and then around about the time when Paul Gentry would be there as a youngster, followed by one in Scotland in Dumfriesshire, I think perhaps... Uh, in Lockerbie or somewhere that direction? Yeah, but the first sale was Lockerbie, yeah. B85, uh, I think. 
John Ashcroft, another wealthy man, uh, flew from farm to farm by helicopter when he, he went to select his sheep in 1984. Do you remember him? He was some character. There. He was the boss of a soft furnishings chain called uh, Colorol. He would be just just about heading out of them um, when we were really getting into them. But I do I do remember the, the stories about the helicopter tearing around the country, <laughs> buying sheep. Yeah. <laughs> would there be an auction in Charol back then in France when people went over, or would they just still be buying them on farms? Uh, most of them were bought on farm. A lot of the rams were bought out of a, a test station. But uh, I know that Jim Quayle and the two Mulligan boys and Ty Robinson would have went on farm. And, you know, the, the, the D8 flocks, the H13 flocks, E6, those were the places that they went to and they got them all together. And Jim Quayle actually chartered two planes to, to bring the first importation of sheep home. Really? Wow. Okay. And you mentioned a couple of flocks there. I think there were A19 as well and, and three or four flocks. And those would be the ones, I suppose, that would set themselves up to make sure that they got all the all the right paperwork and the right um, health certificates to allow them to come in. By the late 80s, the membership of the society was up over a thousand. And uh, so it, it, it grew very quickly. Yeah, it sure did. They were a great sheep. Uh, when they first come in, you know, they had all the attributes that were needed for, for the, the British market. Good lean meat and uh, fast growth and carcass and great skin. So they took off very quickly. Yeah, had a, a great support in the 80s and 90s. And they'd be competing with the Texas, of course, at that time, and which probably would be a little bit more established a little bit earlier, but uh, there seemed to be a, a place for both of them anyway. Let's go on and look at some of those mm-hmm. early flocks in a bit more detail. Um Willie Ingram at uh, Logie Derno started in 1981 after seeing an advert that Jonathan Barber had put in the paper, I believe, and he'd still be a teenager back then, I reckon, and uh, he imported some ewe lambs and a tup without seeing them, I believe, and uh, what a phenomenal breeder he became, uh, um, Robert, still an incredible family business they've got running now. Yeah, they'll be about the biggest Charlie breeders in the UK at the moment, I would think, uh, or amongst them anyway. Um, yeah, they turn out their sheep to perfection at uh, 12 o'clock. They've moved with the times too, I suppose, and uh, yeah, they're, they're one of the, the, the main players in the, the breed now, I would say. And uh, Robert, you brought sheep out for Graham Reed, if I remember, and if there's any Angus enthusiasts listening, uh, Graham also bred Nether Allen Peter Pershaw, one of the most influential bulls in that breed for two or three decades, and Graham was a great sheep breeder, wasn't he, Robert? He was, he was tremendous, he was so enthusiastic, Graham. He had such enthusiasm for the breed, and you just couldn't but admire him. It, it had a tremendous eye for stock, Graham, uh, both with uh, the Charlies and the Angus. And uh, he, he selected his stock obviously very well because right from the start he was at the top of the tree um, until he dispersed. And that got you into the breed, I guess. And when was that that you got uh, got yourself started at Ockenley? We started in 87 with, uh, although Graham, Graham at that time was only about three miles from Ockenley, Mm-hmm. a farm but we actually bought our first uh, yew lambs from a fella called Ian Innes uh, from Aberdeenshire he was uh, the Tullock Allen flock and then we followed that with a couple from John Hunter and then a couple from Howard Davis and that was the kind of basis of our flock we never really bought many females after that but that was the basis for our flock in the mid to late 80s and I mentioned a few other names. Charles Serkin would be an early enthusiast. I think a Dolby female held the breed record of 7,000 guineas for quite a long time. And uh, Charles a hard man to beat and a past chairman and a big stalwart of the breed. Aye, t- Charles's female record actually stayed up until November this year when Drew Cowan from Northern Ireland, one of the flocks you spoke about earlier on, he actually sold two sheep at reduction sale for seven and a half, and one of those went to the Ingrams of Lugie Derno. So, uh-huh. but Charles is he, he's the new president now of the society, just been elected, and a great stalwart for the breed. One of his sheep that I always fancied was sheep that he called Champagne. It was a good sheep. We'll we'll maybe talk about some of those females in a in a minute or two, and a few more names. Robert Gregory uh, again, another enthusiast. Maybe he'd be a little bit later, would he? At uh, Ed Staston, uh, Charles Marwood, uh, he'd be in the early 80s, I think, and he had a, he's got a huge flock of Charolais, I think over 500 ewes or something. Yeah, I would imagine Charles is the biggest flock in Britain and he's, he's been very consistent throughout all the time he's, he's been breeding. You know, you can uh, 
look back through all the decades and Charles has been there or thereabouts. Mm-hmm. Great sheep. Um, there's been a few of Charles's cups. Cairn Hill Crusader that he bought. He really set him up very well. And uh, what was the, the one he bought? Westonville Jubilee. Jubilee was a good sheep. Yeah. He, he bred very well for Charles. You would actually end up with some of that breeding, Johnny, did you? Yeah, I bought foul raised Danny Boy at Lanark. He was a Jubilee son. We'll move on with a few. Derek Daffin, I remember, and his daughter, of course, Jennifer Curtis, and they win all the shows around our direction going back at that time. And Derek was some character, wasn't he? And uh, always brought out some great sheep and a great showman. He was. He was He was uh, quite a character, Daffy. He absolutely detested being beat. He really did. Um, <laughs> he would, like, he would, it would take him a day or two to, to talk to you after he'd been beat sometimes. <laughs> but he always came round. Uh, and uh, Jennifer was a lovely girl. She was uh, great fun. But he bred some absolutely superb sheep. Uh-huh. I remember his uh, a yow. He won everything with uh, uh, El McDusty, she was called. Uh, she, was a, she was an absolute serious thing. A gimmer. They certainly were some strong classes. And another one down in that area with Lionel Logan, another smashing chap in uh, Southam down there near Cheltenham, not far from, from Derek. And uh, he was a successful pig breeder, I think, but a hell of a nice fellow, Lionel, always smiling and uh, it brought out some great sheep. Yeah, uh, Lionel was another character. Uh, he's missed in the breed now, but, you know, his prefix was A&E and he was never early and that's how... That's how everybody knew him as never early Lionel Lorgan. And Peter Coombs, I've got at Mendip, uh, Roland Harris, uh, um, great, great names. He worked a bit closely with uh, David Gardner, I think, for a while, didn't he? Uh, Roland did at Watcom and uh, David Gardner across at Hazelwood and uh, originally Mark Lewis bringing out the sheep and... Uh, Gardner had sold his farm to build a Toyota factory near Derby and... He was some showman, wasn't he? In fact, showing was his was his life, and uh, mainly into the fat stocks. But uh, he had a huge bucket, didn't he? <laughs> and uh, we mentioned him along with the, among the Beltex too. But uh, Charolais were his first love because he said he could get him to eat more. And uh, uh, Johnny, I think you worked for, for <laughs> David. <laughs> Johnny, you worked for David, so I'm sure you can tell us more. Yeah, I worked for David. Like you say, a great character, an absolute showman, and anything he put his hand to, it had to be done right. You know, if it if it had to be fed at, at eight o'clock, it was fed at eight o'clock. There was no half seven or quarter past. And no, I, I, I learned a lot from him. But David well, had a great eye for stock. He was able to see potential in a lot of young lambs. And you know, he, he bought a lot of sheep in various places of various breeds and and brought them out the following year. Is unbeatable, really. He certainly could pick out the show sheep, and as you said, he could bring them on. And I think him and my father was at a similar eye. It was it wasn't about the breeding; it was about getting the trophies on the sideboard. I think. <laughs> and uh, a few other names: Andrew Merrick's family were in early there. Andrew's now back in in France in the Limousin region, and uh, John Geldard at Ray Castle, another gifted breeder, gifted of breeding all sorts of things. John. Yeah, John and and the son Richard and and Charles with their Clins and their Charlies, just really, really hard-working honest people and and that's that's what they've made their reputation on and yeah at this in the 90s the ray castle name was up there with with the most of them as you said honest sheep that went on and, and did well when they came from there and into wales we got di morris down there and again mark lewis used to dress his sheep and then mark also brought out sheep for clive morse he got around a bit this mark lewis didn't he uh you guys both met him around about that time there he was uh, he's an able lad Oh, aye. There was no doubt about it. Mark was fit. He was uh, very, very good. He'd be the top man in the country at the time, I would say, for dressing sheep. Uh, he was. Uh, he took a bit of handling right enough, but um, he was uh, very, very able at dressing and a, a true showman. Um, he brought the sheep out perfectly and he had that kind of way about him where he kind of ruled the ring when he was in it. So for all the size he was, but... Uh, no, he was uh, very able. Dr. Dye had uh, some great times with him over uh-huh. the years. So. Uh, Mark, Mark, I still in touch with Mark and he's still not grown, but uh, yeah, he's still he's still around and he's been here in France now for a few years himself and uh, and uh, in amongst the Lemersons. And, uh, another name you mentioned there, John Hunter at Cairn Hill in Aberdeenshire. And uh, John, another nice fella, but uh, again, bred some tremendous sheep, a great eye for sheep, didn't he? Oh, God, I John's flock of yows would probably 
be up there with some of the best there's ever been uh, when he dispersed. He had a tremendous flock of ewes. Um, he never did a lot of showing, John, but a lot of his stock that he sold would dominate show rings over the years and mm-hmm. dominate sale rings after that. So mm-hmm. uh, he was a terrific, terrific stockman. Or still is. But um, no, John would be up there with the best. Yep. On your side of the water, uh, John, you got Willie McAllister, another able guy, nice fella, and uh, he was in the Beltex as well, of course. And, uh, and there were a few Sierra Leone breeders that went into Beltex, John, both you guys included, I think. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, you know, you mentioned the McAllisters, the very, very capable stock people in cattle and sheep. Uh, but, you know, the, the Beltex and the Charlie, it's the, the, when they're crossed together, they make for a a decent ram or, or a good female as well but you know a pedigree stock is the same you know if you've got an eye for it and a, and a lake for it you work with it just i suppose the natural progression from the time that the charolais came into the time that the beltics came in it would be natural that the one breed they'd be move on to the next one um helen sloan at rig head of course is jim neal's daughter and uh, she started with a ewe lamb as a wedding present from her father and uh, now it's her daughter Hannah that runs the flock, and they're they're still at the top, aren't they, uh, uh, Rickhead? Yeah, they sure are. They had a time out of the breed. Uh, I think it would be after foot and mouth. They would be taken out uh, one of the, the flocks that would be taken out of foot and mouth, and they would mm-hmm. have a time out for a while. But Hannah's come back with a bang. Um, she had a tremendous top lamb a couple of years ago at the Highland. Uh, finished up male champion, and I think she got about four and a half thousand for it, maybe at the premier sale. So ah, they're very able again. Um, I still remember Helen's uh, yow, what was she called now, Milky Way. Milky she was a Way. Tremendous, uh, she was a tremendous yow. Uh, but the early 90s, I think she would win. Would she win the Royal Show, Johnny? Um, she won uh, the Highland twice, I think, did she? She won the Highland twice, right. Uh, mm-hmm. She was some sheep, uh, way ahead of her time. To Jeff and Carol Watson from Solwood, and again still in the breed. And Jeff's, you know, he's still working away, and he's been at the top for a long, long time, and a great sheep dresser as well. And used to dress sheep for my father, I think. And uh, yeah, some man, Jeff, great guy, absolutely great guy, lovely couple. Um, they're my second mum and dad. I've <laughs> uh, I've had some great times with them, and I've I've learned a lot of them. They're, uh, but they're very oh. Exceptional dressers of sheep. There's not a hair out of place by the time when their sheep goes into the ring. Mm-hmm. And uh, another great name, Percy Tate, the legend, I suppose, ex motorbike racer, wingman to Barry Sheen. He could tell tales about those old days. And he dabbled in a few breeds, didn't he? Starting with the Blue Domains, and he had Rouge and Blue Faces. And uh, he was some man, Percy. Uh, Johnny, you did you brought sheep out for him, did you not? I helped, uh, helped Percy whenever. Uh, I was with David Gardner. Yeah, like what a man he was, like the stories he could have to tell about not only about sheep, but about motorbikes and all sorts and probably some stories that, that aren't for broadcasting as well. But, uh, you know, it's just a real character. And he, w- he was very lucky uh, before he dispersed that he, he had Will Price as a stockman, another very capable man that with a set of shears and, and showing one. And you're right. Sadly, Percy's passed away now, but uh, you had one hell of a dispersal sale, didn't he? Uh, um, some good sheep and some good money. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the sheep were a credit to everybody that was involved that day. I had quite a good story about Percy. Uh, it would be when the Charlie's sheep were in the old pig shed at the Highland, and uh, the show was finished anyway. Uh, everybody was away home. Uh, Dad got a phone call from Percy, and he was at... I'm trying to remember what stop it was. It was way, way down the M6 anyway. And he asked Dad if he could nip back to the Highland Show and pick up his, Percy's yow lamb that he'd left. <laughs> <laughs> he'd, he'd, he'd loaded up everything and forgot his yow lamb. And if I mind right, if I mind right, she'd won our class or something. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, we got her home and we gave her bed and breakfast for a couple of weeks. And I think she went in the lorry down to the Royal. Uh-huh. Uh, if I remember rightly, it would be about 96, 97, she ended up in the lorry down to the Royal and Percy got her there. So. <laughs> Great, uh, he was some man, we all enjoyed his company for sure. And um, moving on, and we've covered a few flocks, we might catch up with a few in a minute when we look at some of the rams, but the, round about that time, of course, there was a demand for the commercial tops and some of these boys got fairly big at it and you know, there'd be some big rings full of shillings at, uh, at Kelso. Uh, Robert? Yeah, there was. There was uh, two or three boys really going hard at it at that time. 
the biggest would be Brian Atkinson, who, if I remember correctly, had a hundred shearlings there uh, in nineteen ninety nine or two thousand. Hundred shearlings, uh, well, yeah, deal. forward. At that time, the shearlings had two rings, so he had uh, he split it between. If I remember rightly, it was uh, LNS and United Auctions that were selling, so they had fifty each. But it was quite an achievement to have a hundred, and they were big, powerful sheep. You know, they sold very well, so. Mm -hmm. would, uh, no other breeds were anywhere near that. I think the only other breed would be uh, Malcolm Stewart. Andy, mm -hmm. now they would have roughly 100 tups there at that time, but that was a big achievement for the breed. Sure. The Charolais breed claimed to have started the first sire reference scheme. Would that be right, fellas? That would be probably be one of the, the first ones, yeah. Uh, it was a small group of people. Not everybody agreed with it, but... Uh, it's the same with most things. You'll have your followers and, and, and other ones that, that won't follow. So, From those early days, soon the Charolais breed started winning interbreeds, didn't they? And they became the sheep to beat and uh, winning champions of champions. And they'd have probably won more interbreeds than uh, most other breeds over the last four decades, wouldn't they? Oh, I, I would say it definitely because, you know, a Charolais sheep presented right to just, just have so much ring presence and there's sound and the size of them you know if you get the right one they'll just go in and command a ring i feel your eye yeah let's look at some of those early influential rams and uh, i've got a list of a few and you guys uh, will know a lot more than me but early on i've got Crogham charlie and he seemed to be the face of the breed at the time at the shows anyway and uh, I know he bred some great daughters, mm -hmm. but he, he must have clocked up some miles because he was generally on the trade stand at just about every event we went to. He's a sheep. I can't actually remember it very much about it. I do remember seeing him in uh, a number of pedigrees from the, the late 80s and 90s. I don't think I ever saw the sheep in the flesh, but uh, he'd been an imported sheep, I think, was he? I think he would, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, he definitely left a stamp because he was he was in all the pedigrees early on when we were first involved. Yeah. Uh, moving on, we got Elmwick Charles, who was a uh, runner-up at the first Royal Show for Derek Daffin. Do you remember him? This is before your time, guys. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's what age do you think we are, Andy? <laughs> Andy, I was still getting my bum wiped then. <laughs> Well, a few of those C's, another one, Bode Crackerjack, uh, won the Highland for Ranald Fowler in 1985 when he was the sire of Logan Diplomat and another sheep that's in a lot of pedigrees, I think. Yeah, Logan yeah. Diplomat did, did a lot of good, left a lot of good sheep. Moving on a little bit, Manxman George was a ram imported into the Isle of Man by a man called David Hookham and uh, he bred Manxman Nessie. Uh, BS6007, who was probably one of the most influential sires in the breed and bought as a lamb by Ian Innes from Aberdeenshire. Yeah, at that time, I would say Nessie would be the one that I first remember really as, as the one that really put a stamp in the Charlies. Our first real lucky strike, you might say, was a Nessie son we bought at Kelso. Uh, we spied him in uh, about 2000. Um, from a pen, a, a breeder from uh, north of England, and we bought him. He actually only cost a couple of hundred pounds, but he was sire of the majority of our early champions, and that was an essay son. Um, Johnny, we'll talk about a top called Jack. Uh, I think Jim Quayle imported him, but I remember Mark and I seeing him in a field there in, in Northern Ireland in the late 80s, running with 40 or 50 ewes, and I think uh, we saw you at the same time. He was some sheep, wasn't he? He put a backbone in a lot of flocks, didn't he? He was he was what everybody wanted their Charlies to look like. He was a tremendous animal. Again, he was owned by the two Mulligans and Ty Robinson and Jim Quayle. And I think he was the first Charlie ever to win an interbreed. He won the, the interbreed at, at Balmoral Show with the first year Charlies had show classes there. But the like the progeny that he left, you know, females and males, it was unrivaled for a while. You mentioned the interbreeds. He actually won 10 interbreeds in total. He won five in his first year and another five in his second year, as you said, including Balmoral. And he sired £55,000 worth of progeny in his first two years. That's, that's a, some going for a sheep back then. It is, yeah. Uh, it was a fantastic go. But uh, my mother would have to say that she has a claim to fame because she owned the, the only sheep that ever beat him in an interbreed <laughs> in, those, in, in one of those two years with it aboard the Leicester. So 
I, I better make sure it mentioned that. Yeah, indeed. Must have, must have had bigger lugs, did it? Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> he was some beast, I remember him. And uh, uh, yeah. Banville Baron, he was by Jack and bred by the Mulligan brothers. And uh, Mark Lewis bought him in uh, Porter Down for 1300 for Clive Morse. And uh, he won a lot of shows. And eventually he was sold at uh, Clive Morse's dispersal for 7500 and Pennywern Ginger Nut, another one that David Gardner had, this time bred by Di Morris, I think. And I think he went uh, around being unbeaten in about 1989 there. Yeah, he was a great sheep. What a block of meat he was. I, I still remember him. It'd be the closest thing to a Beltex, I think, the Charlie Breed ever had. He was uh, a, a massive back end and top on him. And Hunter was interbreed champion at the Three Counties show, and I remember him... Uh, beating uh, a, a prominent and uh, a well-seasoned Suffolk and reserve place, which Mark Lewis was delighted about. And uh, he was bred by John Hunter, who sold him to Roland Harris, who then eventually sold him to David Gardner for 7,000. Do you remember him? I just remember him. He was a very big, long, sound sheep. And then did David have another one the following year, the two years later, and he called him Young Hunter. Uh-huh. Uh, but again, is I think he went on beating that year in the show ring. He certainly went on and won the Royal in 1991, you're right. Um, Tully Callum Royal Scott, male champion 1996. Now we're into your era, guys. Tell me about him. Uh, he was top lamb at the Highland Show, 96. Absolutely outstanding in the class that day. I think uh, he went from there to Banbury and he was sold to, I think it was the North England boys, John Geldard. Richard Harrison, maybe, for about 10,000. Ah, he was a, an absolute powerhouse of a, a lamb. Glenbrook Jarvis would be a breed record breaker again to David Gardner, I think was the 16,000, Johnny. I remember him, that was the day of, of the Glenbrook dispersal. Again, a tremendous carcass of a sheep. He bred very well, and again, Terry and Billy Brown had, had a great show season with him. Carthorpe Grand Duke from the Southam Dispersal of 4,200. Uh, a bold first choice, won the Welsh and the Premier, and Lionel Organ and Robert Gregory bought him. Right, Nether Allen Envoy, um, Robert. He was by Banville Baron, I think, and out of uh, Nether Allen Majesty, and uh, uh, he was sold by Graham Reid, uh, 3,400, I think, uh, bought by Brian Atkinson. Yep. It was the result of a a championship meeting from the, the Royal Show in 1992, I think it was. And uh, it was just at the time when the sire reference scheme was uh, been introduced into the breed. And he was the perfect sheep at that time for that. He was a very big, long... He wouldn't have ever had his cup of tea. He probably would lack a little in the back end as a lamb and a shearling. But it was the way that the, the sire reference scheme was... Uh, set up at the time, it was big long sheep they wanted with with loin, and they did very well. And within the scheme, a lot of people used them. One name in particular that probably jumps out is uh, Richard and Mary Tullock, uh, who were from they were from the Norfolk area, if I remember rightly. But they had a absolute terrific run with them with champions year after year. And would they be recording weight recording back then for the side restaurant scheme? Would he have figures? Oh yeah, it was it was all figures at that point. I think Johnny was it. It was B. Uh... And then moving on to the modern day, there's still some that are out there in shaping the breed. And uh, who's the guy in the modern days, uh, Johnny, that we should talk about? Well, I suppose you'd have to mention the a ram that stands out would be the record holder at the minute, uh, knocking shocking, twenty five thousand in Worcester. He was bought by Robert Gregory and bred by Abby Mosley, and and uh, he seems to have have done a lot of sons sold out of him and daughters. It's a few years, and he seems to be doing a job. And we normally look at a few early female bloodlines that shaped the breed there, and we couldn't look much further really than uh, Jim Kinnaird's Queen of the Ring. And she was his very first lamb, and uh, what a beast, uh, uh, Robert tells. Yeah, she's probably my first memory of a Charlie sheep. To be honest, she was just uh, outstanding. Even today, that yow could go in and win shows. She just had such a presence about her. Uh, beautiful head, carcass, skin. She had a leg in every corner. She was just 
She's just a perfect Charlie, in my opinion, and she bred like one too, so... She did uh, Findati Majorette in 1992, was a daughter of hers, and and a daughter of that sold to Herbie Kennedy for 5000 at the Jim Signy 21st anniversary sale. So you're right, she was a breeder. But going back to, to Jimmy Kinnaird, I remember her being in the ring, and uh, Jimmy just had a, an easy way about him, didn't he? You just as soon as you saw him in the ring, just he knew he was winning, and the sheep knew they were winning. It was uh, it was it was everybody else go home time, wasn't it, Johnny? It was uh, again. Jimmy was one of those characters, but you know the sheep. They were brought out to absolute perfection, you know. And when you say whenever he came into the ring, those animals just looked like champions all day long. So an Auchinleigh Grace uh, Robert, she won the Royal and the Highland, and she went on to to be in amongst the interbreeds as well. I think uh, did she did she win a pair of those? Yes, yeah, she was reserve interbreed uh, uh, both. Uh, Suffolk beaters at the Highland and uh, uh, Ryland beaters at the Royal. So I told you there uh, was a that... future. I told you there was a future in this Ryland breed. <laughs> <laughs> a Ryland that was dressed like a Beltex by a certain Mark Lewis. <laughs> he crops up everywhere, that boy. And uh, a, a you that stands out a little bit later, Knight and Pride from uh, from Percy Tate, and she was champion at the Royal Welsh, I think, in uh, 1999 after being reserve champion in 1998. She was some beast. I, uh, again, Percy was able to bring them out to perfection, and she just was what a female should look like, really. Long, clean, head up, just commanded the ring every time. We mentioned a few other females earlier on. Any others that I've missed there? Uh, early ones that have made their mark in the breed? One I would mention, I always thought she was a beautiful yow. I uh, adored her. Uh, she was pipped at the post a few times. It was one that Johnny actually showed, uh, Stanek Diana. She was uh, a tremendous example of the breed. Uh, Johnny would show her. You'd have her two or three years with uh, Murray McIlroy, Johnny. Is that right? Uh, yeah, showed her twice. She was reserved at the Highland and reserved at the Royal. Yeah, she was a, an absolute perfect example of the breed. Beautifully fleshed animal. Great character. Another able man, Mario McElwraith. And, uh, and another you that should get a mention is uh, Castle Low Flashy Lady from uh, Tim Pritchard. And uh, one that I surprised you guys haven't mentioned, Daisy Deathwish, who's out in my field there. She's never quite got to the shows, but uh, she's a Charolais too. She needs a mention. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of people quite relieved about that. She's never <laughs> made the shows. I've, I've met Daisy, and she has quite, she's quite a weapon, to put it mildly. <laughs> <laughs> and then moving on, the, the premier Charolais sale moved on to Worcester. Um, when, when was that? It, it used to be at Bambury, and then Bambury was... The auction was sold, then it moved to the Royal Showgrounds, didn't it, at Stonely? It was at Litchfield for a while, too. And then it went to Litchfield, yeah, that, that's where, where Jubilee was, mm -hmm. was was bought. And then it went from Litchfield then, it must have went from Litchfield to Worcester then. Yeah, it must have been about early, mid-2000s. Yeah, it must have been, yeah. I would think. And still the main sale today, and there'll be other sales, I'm sure, in Carlisle and wherever, but it's still the premier sale, isn't it, that a lot of good sheep get to. And the the sheep are a lot bigger now in the UK than they are here in France, and uh, are they still getting bigger, Johnny? Are they, are they, are they sort of levelled a little bit? They were getting some massive, massive charolais amongst you. Uh, personally, I think some of them were getting far too big. Uh, they've sort of levelled themselves out a bit now. You know, a sheep can only be the size of a sheep, and the majority of them are there to produce a commercial lamb, which the Charlie can easily do. So, but no, they've leveled themselves out now a bit. The Charlies, whenever they first come from France, they had to change slightly to suit uh, it's the British climate, really. But they've, they've squared themselves up now, and they're, they're one of the major terminal breeds at the minute. Mm -hmm. And you're on council, Johnny, I believe. Is that right? I've just come off council, yeah, but I'm I'm still involved with the society through judging seminars and show and sales committees. But how are the breed numbers with the society nowadays? Are, are we up or down? Are, are stable? It's just fairly stable at the minute. There's been quite a lot of new members this past uh, two years. I would say the membership, the average age, has dropped dramatically this past few years. I don't know what the main reason for it is, but, you know, 
more of these online sales and you know, a lot of things done over Facebook and and technology now and it, it's drawn a, a younger crowd. It's great to hear that the younger crowd are coming in and you touched on the modern way and obviously the COVID pandemic is moving that one along to some of these online sales and, and I think some of these are here to stay, aren't they? Uh, some of the, you know, the likes of James Alexander and boys are just pushing this job forward to, to try and get uh, these online sales working maybe it's for the good or, or for the bad well like you say the covid pandemic has has made everybody change their ways and uh, if you want to keep up with the times and keep a business going we all had to go with the online sales uh, you've mentioned the jlax they're extremely good at what to do they've been well branded and they've had a, another flying sale at the weekend but a lot of the auction marts are working hard and and They've kept the, the markets open and kept it going and kept the commercial end of it going, which, is, you know, when I think the auction companies, they do need a, a big mansion for that because if, if we can't sell the commercial man, there's no need for pedigree sheep. Very true. And Robert, uh, you sell a lot of tops, uh, you run a lot of sheep, and uh, you don't show your charolais anymore, do you? Since you moved over to producing all grass-fed, late-born, sort of March-April shearlings, but uh, you do sell a lot of, uh, of charolais and a lot of other breeds, and how's the demand for the charolais breed against the other sheep that you sell? Well, surprisingly, from my point of view, last year the, the charolais are very easy to move. Uh, there's been a kind of struggle in Scotland just the last wee while, the, the charolais... To, to be moving them and selling them. But last year, there was a great demand for them. I think uh, people were starting to see that uh, the attributes of the breed. And we did all the Charlie's sold before anything else last year. Also privately at home. It was no bother at all. So hopefully that's that's them um, turned the corner in Scotland. It's been a bit of a struggle uh, right. the last few years. We're up against the Texel up here, obviously. It's, it's very strong in this area. And the Beltex... I've been making moves, so hopefully the Charlie's on its way back. And we, I talked uh, last week to a few Beltex breeders on on a podcast, and, and your name was mentioned. I think you do run a lot of crossbred tops as well. You sell a lot of crossbred tops, and uh, the Charlie will feature in a lot of those crosses, won't it? Yeah, we cross 100 uh, Charlie yows to the, the Beltex, and uh, we keep the, the yow lambs for our cross flock, and uh, the Top lambs are all sold as shearlings, as cross belt at Charlie Shearlings, and there's a there's a huge demand nationwide for them. Never mind Scotland, it's uh, insatiable. Uh, you're getting the best of both worlds, you know the, the extreme carcass of the Beltex with the the length and the the skin and the the flesh and ability of the Charlie and the growth. So yeah, it's a great cross. And John, you live in Cumbria these days there at, at Inglewood. There, you're you're lambing a lot of sheep as well. Yeah, we're we're just about finished lambing the fourteen hundred ewes this time. Uh, lambing's went quite well. It hasn't been without its problems. Well, gentlemen, it's been great to speak to the pair of you. We've all known each other a long time, and it's good to hear about the the Charolais breed and its successes and its early origins. And uh, I know you're both still in the middle of lambing, so uh, appreciate you taking your time out to talk to me. And uh, let's hope we can get back to some normality in the next. Uh, the rest of this year, maybe, and all get together and um, uh, enjoy a dram together. Cheers, fellas. Thanks for your time. Cheers, Andy. Cheers. We'll see you soon. See you later. Yeah, right. Thank you for listening to our Top Lines and Tales podcast. Please tune in to our Top Lines and Tales Facebook page where you'll find photographs to back up this episode and our other episodes as well.